So this segment is going to be on um, the unique learning experiences around con contracting and implementation of spotted lanternfly management strategies. And so for this, we have a panel together today and like to Panelists, introduce- if you could please um, turn your video cameras on so we can see you. And I think we have everyone. Yep, I believe so. All right, so for the panel, um, I'm just gonna go through the list of individuals that we have on here. So we have uh, Peter Benz, uh, owner of Plant Health Solutions. Peter Benz Jr. is a part owner of Plant Health Solutions located in Central Bucks County, Pennsylvania. This business specializes in the prevention, treatment, and cure of diseases and pests in trees and shrubs. PHS has been contracted to work on the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture's Spotted Lanternfly Eradication Project for the last five years. PHS also works residentially throughout Eastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey on the suppression of spotted lanternfly feeding on favored plant materials. Next, we have Greg Parra, who is staff scientist at USDA APHIS. And for Greg, having grown up in California, Greg has always had a strong interest in agriculture and has worked in many different fields related to agriculture and horticulture since 1983 in both Eastern and Western states. This experience led to him working with the USDA beginning in 2004 due to the wide ranging issues and programs that the science and technology group of USDA PPQ is engaged in. Um, one of the areas of responsibility has been the spotted lanternfly beginning in 2014 when it was first confirmed in Pennsylvania. His specific group within USDA provides the scientific and technical support to their two other core functional groups, policy and management, as well as field operations, which most groups in each state are more familiar with. He works with several other members of his group and with support of their leadership, they continue to collect and track the most current information and research results related to spotted lanternfly to provide recommendations and science-based information for decision-making. Next, we have uh, Katie Balecki. She is the spotted lanternfly project coordinator with the Delaware Department of Agriculture. She works with the uh, Delaware Department of Agriculture as the um, SLF program coordinator she graduated from Delaware State University with a degree in wildlife management in 2016. She started DDA in 2018 as the first casual seasonal to work with spotted lanternfly. And in 2020, she became the program coordinator through the state of Delaware. She works closely with the USDA to come up with the best practices to protect Delaware's agriculture and slow the spread of spotted lanternfly by targeting high trafficked areas that are at risk for the most spotted lanternfly movement. Next, we have Matt Travis, who's a state plant health director with USDA APHIS. Matt is the spotted lanternfly multi-state coordinator um, for field operations and is responsible for operations across 11 states and working with state and other partners to mitigate spotted lanternfly populations. Prior to this assignment, Matt held positions as the Maryland and DC state director for the USDA, state regulatory official for the nursery industry in Annapolis, Maryland six years as an urban biologist with the University of Maryland and five years as a contract agricultural researcher in Eastern Pennsylvania. Matt has served in uniform for 27 years in the US Army and Army National Guard. He's raised on a small farm in Southeastern Pennsylvania and graduated from Penn State University with a Bachelor of Science in Entomology and minor in Horticulture. He also has graduated from multiple military schools and institutions. And our last panelist is David Anderson, Director of Prog Product Development and Regulatory Affairs at Rainbow Ecoscience. Dave is the, um, has been with the company for about 16 years. He graduated from Iowa State University with a master's degree in horticulture. And in his role at Rainbow, Dave is responsible for developing new products and protocols along with managing EPA registrations. Dave has led Rainbow's efforts in conducting research on spotted lanternfly and in developing effective treatment protocols. In addition, Dave has worked with state agencies to obtain 24C registrations, allowing more trees to be treated in state and USDA SLF management programs. 
So wanted to thank all the panelists for being here today. Um, first, wanted to allow everyone the opportunity to um, kind of introduce themselves. So I'm going to go kind of in order on here. Hey, before we get started, I just want to let you guys know I'm just I'm trying to get panelists to share videos. We're having a few issues, ongoing issues within Teams and Zoom and ability to share. So it is what it is. Um, panelists, if you can use the raise hand function as we go around the horn with questions, that will help us to mitigate since we can't see all of your faces. Perfect. And so with that, I'll uh, go ahead and turn this over to Peter Benz. You want to provide an introduction to yourself? Yes, hello. Uh, as stated earlier, I have been working on the USDA eradication program since 2017. Um, killed millions of these insects thanks to the help of Rainbow. Um, looking forward to chatting with you guys and seeing if there's any new advancements here. Perfect. And uh, looks like a, I'm not seeing Greg on here just yet. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm on here. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's just showing us Matt Travis. Perfect. Yeah. Greg, I'll let you go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I like you mentioned in my bio, I've been uh, working with Spotted Landflyer, or it's one of my areas of responsibility since 2014. So, um, yeah, one of my, uh, one of the things I, I definitely track. You know, with the help of others at work, is of course every you know all the ongoing research uh, that's occurring with spotted landfly. Like not only it's funded through USDA, but everything going on maybe either privately or with universities and trying to track what the outcomes are. Perfect. Thank you for that, Greg. Next we have Katie. Oh, um, so I am having problems with my uh, camera itself. Um, but yeah, so I started with uh, Spotted Lanternfly, um, got hired on as one of the first casual seasonals. Um, since then, I kind of climbed through the ladders. Now I supervise the team to oversee uh, projects throughout the state. So I could be in Wilmington up north one hour and then all the way down, down at the beaches the next. Um, so we do work a lot with other uh, municipalities, Del Dot, railroads, um, USDA, other states. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Perfect. Thank you for that, Katie. Uh, next, we have Matt Travis. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, <clears throat> Matt Travis, as everybody, as uh, the introduction said, I work for USDA APHIS, and I've been working on Spotted Atlanta Fly since 2017 um, as a state director, first in Maryland. Uh, having it uh, move south out of PA into Maryland uh, was one of our uh, first introductions to uh, to uh, spotted lanternfly. Uh, I actually uh, grew up, born and raised in Pennsylvania, and so I'm very familiar and have been to Pennsylvania several times. So I've seen uh, what their populations look like um, and have been working in the operational framework for some time. Um, Multi-state coordinator, in the last two years. And currently, I'm actually the acting policy manager as well uh, for the Spotted Lanternfly program for USDA APHIS. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you for that, Matt. And last but not least, we have Dave Anderson. Yeah, um, so I direct rate Rainbow's research, um, product development, and have been working with Spotlight Airfly since 2017, working with universities, with USDA, with independent contractors to you know, conduct these research trials, essentially evaluating, evaluating different active ingredients to find you know, what works, the, a protocol that will work for controlling spot lantern fly. We've tested imidacloprid, dinotefuran, flunicamid, some diamides, and other insecticides. And just as, as Mark presented earlier, uh, dinotefuran seems to be the, the active that works the best for controlling spot lantern fly. Um, and then I've also been working with the states and USDA to establish these 24C labels that will allow the treatment programs to treat, you know, go from 128 inches per acre up to like 300 some inches that they can treat um, so they can maximize the number of trees, you know, under, under protection or at least 
treated so they can um, eliminate that spot lanternfly population as best as possible. So, so if there are anyone anyone out there that's uh, interested in our research further and from further information on our research or want to do research or the estate that needs to get a 24C, uh, be happy to chat with send me an email. We can um, follow up with you and we can get that in place. Perfect. Thank you for that, Dave. Um, and with that, uh, Dave, if you want to put your, your email in the chat, that would be that'd be great. Um, and so just for everyone here, how we're going to go about um, this panel is, uh, as I indicated, we have, a, we have a list of questions to get things started. Um, but this is an opportunity for everyone in attendance today to uh, ask questions that you would like to have answered. Um, we have a variety of people across um, you know, different specialties around spotted lanternfly. Um, so this is going to be a, a great opportunity to get some of your questions answered. So the uh, first question I'm going to ask is, um, and this is a little bit geared towards more of the kind of municipality government entities, is how do you typically go about finding subcontractors to perform treatments for spotted lanternfly or other kind of invasive um, insects? I'll let Matt start. Yeah, uh, thanks, Eric. So uh, for USDA, uh, we have a uh, a contract officer uh, that helps us uh, review and look at potential contractors. The first place we go, however, I will tell you, is whether we have any GSA uh, listed contractors. So if you have uh, registered under SAM.gov and you're a listed contractor within uh, the General Services Administration or GSA, um, that would be one place that we would start uh, looking to see if we have any GSA contractors uh, in the region. Um, and that's how we usually start our process. Um, after that, we also, of course, for federal government have several, we have to uh, abide by rules and regulations when it comes to awarding contracts. So we're looking at um, if it's a minority business or a small business owner, um, there are certain restrictions or regulations that we have to adhere to uh, before we can uh, award a contract. And then of course we go to uh, the bidding process and look at uh, the, bidding, the bidding process, have to have at least three valid bids based on the work and the scope of work. And uh, then we can go forward with awarding that contract uh, based on the, um, on the uh, most appropriate cost-effective contract. Perfect. Thank you for that, Matt. Uh, additionally, I wanted to note as well, um, we, have, we have Paul Kurtz on as well, and Paul just uh, presented earlier. Paul's gonna be a, another resource to, um, you know, to answer any of these questions. Is, uh, Paul or Katie, any other additional insight that uh, you'd like to provide? Uh, no, I thought that, you know, everything right now is fine. For the, I'm good. Perfect. <laughs> That's a solid answer. <laughs> Thank you. All right, next question. Um, and so th this one uh, is, there sometimes seems to be a negative public perception around pesticide use. Uh, how do you manage or deal with this within any of your treatment programs? Uh, Pete Benz. Yeah, so I actually deal with this question a lot coming from homeowners on the residential side. Um, best way to describe this is the old mosquito trucks that used to drive down the street just spraying all over the place. That's not what we're looking for these days. Um, and I always mention you guys rainbow and all of the things that you have developed over the years allows us to use minimal amounts of the product. Um, and again, I like to use the word product instead of saying things like chemical. Um, minimal amount of product to get the maximum efficacy for the uh, targeted pest. Um, yeah, you guys use the, the safest ingredients and you put a lot of time into making sure that they are effective while 
not harming um, the non-target pests and also doing the treatments at the proper time of year so you're not killing beneficials like bees and things like that. Perfect. Dave, I'll go to you next. Yeah, um, you know, occasionally we'll come across uh, people asking questions when we're doing our research trials. Our trials are done out in public. And, you know, in those cases, we just explain what we're doing. We're doing a research trial. We're testing new treatments to protect against this pest, you know, causing this damage. And usually that satisfies their their interest. Actually, a lot of times with the needs, good. Oh, great! I'll be more. They're more aware of what's going on and want to help out at times. So, um, it's just basic communication is the key piece. What I've seen. Perfect. Anyone else? Hi, Eric. This is Greg again. Yeah, I would just you know echo it. Um, both uh, Peter and uh, David said, and then also I, I know uh, Paul had that in his presentation too, is just, you know, getting that information out to the public and making them aware, you know, as much as possible. Because even states that don't have spotted landfly yet, they reach out to Matt, uh, you know, for information because they're looking for that too. They're looking to try and get the word out, you know, before it gets there, but just try and build that awareness uh, before, um, you know, if SLF shows up, because of course, uh, you know, if you wait till afterwards, then you run into like, you know, what Paul was showing either with the call-ins or the email, like getting that all in place, getting that set up, making sure people know what they're looking for. Like it just helps out a lot. And same thing with the treatment that people are aware that you're out there doing that work and what you're doing it for and what you're trying to do, then that, that helps out too. And especially if they feel like they're part of it. Perfect. Thanks for that, Greg. And Katie. Yeah, so um, we, exp in Delaware, we're a pretty small state, so we're pretty familiar with all, all of the communities, um, whether they're, you know, retirement communities, uh, vacation communities. Um, so right now we're dealing with um, Ocean View. It's, it's down at the beach, very, um, very artsy kind of town. It's a, a lot of vacationers or retirees. Um, so we've just had spotted lantern fly there and, and we almost have to prepare a message going in because we get a lot of, uh, people coming out and, and asking what we're doing and are they going to harm their, are we going to harm their strawberries or something like that? And, um, so we have to actually get like a message ready for them. I have to kind of train the, the, uh, the seasonals on how to communicate with the public. And um, also like just letting our, our contractors know that, hey, we're stepping in a, a very curious community. They'll ask a lot of questions. Um, and if we need signatures from, from homeowners, uh, we make sure to tell them, you know, it's, it's safe. Uh, we do it on the, on days where we won't see rain and and follow the product label. So communication with the homeowners is, is, is really important, especially in, in these types of communities that we see in, in small Delaware. Sure, thank you for that, Katie. Okay. So uh, we'll move on to the, the next question. And this is, uh, how do you decide what treatment approach to do in a given area? Um, you know, obviously with, uh, with some of Eric Day's uh, work, he showed that, you know, there's a wide list of uh, different species that uh, this is going to go ahead and, you know, attack or feed on. Um, and so for those of you who have kind of created some of the management uh, programs, um, whether it be kind of at a, a government level or from a kind of a, a contractor perspective when you're working with individual homeowners, how do you determine your treatment approach? I guess I can, you know, for us here in New Jersey, we're following the biology of the insect, but also the effectiveness of the chemical and knowing that you can you know, get a large group of nymphs with a contact 
and you know the absorption of the that material will do a lot more than waiting for it you know in the, the you know later part of the summer so getting them early as well as then you know we only um put the dinotephron in tree of heaven we do not do any other trees so maples and anything else that may you know uh contractors are doing that you know that's all we do so we're going after what they're going to feed on when they turn uh you know to fourth in star as well as adults and hopefully between you know those practices we're going to get the most kind of bang for a buck you know utilizing the uh you know each type of chemical perfect that uh thanks we'll move over to greg Okay, thanks, Eric. I was going to let uh, Matt go first before I weigh in. I think Matt will probably say a lot of what I'm going to say, <laughs> but I might add some more detail. Sure. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Greg. So, what um, you know, we use we look at different sites. I mean, it's the one thing about this fest is that we find it in a lot of different sites, and I've heard this multi repeated several times. I mean. If you look at where it lays the egg masses, the trees or the host list, I mean, it's it's across a lot of different landscapes. And so it's not, it's not a traditional agriculture pest. It's not necessarily a traditional landscape pest. It's kind of a, a mixture of things. And we've been in sites that are industrial, of course, along railroads, along the highway, truck stops, things like that. So the sites are varied and I'd say, I think what Paul said is very key. At the same time, we also have to look at the site itself and what does the site lend itself to with what tactics or techniques we can use in that particular site. Are there sensitivities or things we have to be concerned about? Are we in a wetland area? Are we near a residential area? We have to make sure that we're careful and protective and sensitive to those things. And what's gonna be most effective based on the life stage that we're facing, uh, whether it's a, a, an egg mass, um, are we looking at nymphs? Or are we looking at adults? And then where are they located? So, you know, a contact knockdown treatment um, may be appropriate for some life stages. It's not going to be appropriate for all life stages. And so for the egg mass treatments, you know, we have used and are continuing to use in the field uh, golden pest spray oil uh, as an oversight on the egg masses itself because it's something that we found effective. We can also treat uh, throughout the season, as long as the temperatures stay above 40, you know, we're still able to get out and treat. Um, so I think it, you have to take into account not only the biology and life cycle, uh, the chemical that's most effective, but you also have to look at the site and what does the site, you know, what are the challenges of, this, challenges of the site? We may not be able to get in with say a truck mounted uh, spray rig, we may need to walk it in and backpack it in. Um, and so there are all those challenges, logistical and other challenges that we have to consider when we get to a site, get to a property. Um, you know, we have to gain access for us, we have to gain permission and access. So those are important pieces we have to kind of have uh, established prior to a, a treatment crew getting to the site. Great. And the only thing I would add to that is, you know, of course, like both Paul and Matt mentioned, you know, depending on when you find it, like where, what stage of the life cycle you're in is going to determine uh, also what, what you can do at that time where maybe there won't be, of course, people will be anxious, you know, if you find it late in the season in an area that's not, hasn't been before, but then you, you do have some time, you have a window over the winter when it's only going to be there as an egg mass to kind of formulate a plan and figure out what to do and then also go after the egg masses. But then, you know, of course, if you find something that's totally disconnected as a satellite, you know, you do your best you can to try and determine, you know, possibly how long it's been there based on the size of the population. And maybe you have a different approach because you could really knock it back quite a bit or get it down to like where you, you, you know, approaching eradication. But, uh, you know, if it's larger than that or over a larger area, then, you know, you're kind of in for like a bigger fight and trying to figure out what to do. And we're more targeting the high risk areas for that long distance movement. That's where most of our effort is at this time, not an area wide treatment, uh, which is what some groups might do, or they might have a different strategy if it's a 
satellite, of course, you know, and we're talking about like the generally infested areas where we're taking that approach for the high risk sites. And then also going in, not thinking like we're just using one thing going into a site, like trying to use all the tools or whatever's available to do this, not thinking that, you know, either like one method or one approach is going to, um, is going to do, uh, is going to take care of that population or reduce back, we're trying to keep everything on the table that uh, we're allowed to use under our, our environmental assessments for those sites. Perfect. Um, and there's actually a, a question in the chat that I feel like kind of piggybacks around this question. Uh, Emma was wondering about uh, um, if there's kind of a, a summarized recommended approach to treatment in areas where infestations are not yet a huge problem. Um, if the resources for treatment um, are present, should those areas be treated now, perhaps as a service to existing treatments for other pests or species? Um, one of the things I, I'll actually just quick chime in there. I think if you're in an area where spotted lanternfly is not currently present at yet, um, but you know you're, it's kind of surrounding or you're kind of starting to prepare for it, what I would particularly do is uh, start removing some of that tree of heaven, um, getting rid of some of its host species in areas that uh, you know, you know, it, it's not exactly kind of like a prominent tree at or whatnot. Um, those are some of the kind of the initial efforts that I personally would probably be doing in order to start preparing for it. Um, Pete? Just a quick side note to go off of what you just said. Um, hopefully everybody knows this, but just in case they don't, if you are removing tree of heaven, do not do so without herbicide. Uh, if you cut the trees down, and you just leave that stump, you are going to come back the following season and you are going to be overwhelmed. So make sure right after you cut that tree down, get the herbicide on the stump quickly so you actually kill the stored carbohydrates in the root zone. Yes, that's a, that's a very important distinction. Thank you for, for making that. Because uh, absolutely, if, uh, if you're not doing that, it's just going to re-sprout in that spot. So making sure to hit it with an herbicide. Uh, one of the things, the particular herbicide we've used a lot is Sightline. It's a triclopyr. Um, and you can apply that in a variety of different ways, but uh, you can also just kind of making sure to, to hit that uh, vascular tissue so it's taken up in there and that's not re-sprouting. Right. Perfect. Uh, Matt? Yeah, I think it's I think it's an important question. Um, one of the things we've been talking to states that don't have spotted lanternfly uh, outside of communication is I think, and it's been hit on here, talked about. I know uh, Dave mentioned it. I think some others mentioned it. Is making sure you have, you know, you have your licenses and registrations for your products ready. Um, we have found, and again, with multiple products, you know, certain states don't have their licensing or their registrations, whether that's the 24C. Uh, two double E, whatever that license or registration is required, make sure they have that, and then making sure that they have their their crews and and folks ready to go out and treat, and they have access. Um, access has been important for our smaller populations where we have spotted lanternfly in smaller populations. Uh, we have gone in, and again, like Greg said and mentioned, we go after multiple stages and and with multiple products. So we're going in and and going after egg masses where and when we can find egg masses. Um, we go after nymphs very quickly. Uh, this year, we've been using a lot of bifenthrin against the nymphs. And then we start our dinotefuran. And, and again, the timing of the dinotefuran has been somewhat varied based on what the state re regulations are. Some can start earlier, some cannot start until after uh, you know, June 1st, have to wait until much later in the season. So use of those products you know, and, but having those tools ready and, and, and having those available and ready to go in. And again, knowing the sites that you find it or could find it is also important. So I think those are our key, key things. Perfect. Uh, Dave, we'll go to you. <clears throat> yeah, I think the, uh, the treatment plan would be based on the outcome of what you're trying to accomplish. If, you're, if it's a single property that you're trying to protect, I wouldn't treat it until until um, you saw spot lanternfly on the property and it was causing a problem, um, or there's enough nymphs there they you know take enough nymphs. Um, 
if it was for monitoring, then maybe a trap tree would make sense. You know, you treat a tree and you kind of put something underneath there to capture any dead insects. Um, I would do it that way. But if it's a very low population, I would not go out there and just mass or just go out there and treat um, trees or shrubs just because they might be there. It's you want to make sure the pest is there or has a history of being there multiple years in a row before I would do any, anything like a broadcast treatment or a standard treatment. Great, thanks for that, Dave. Um, Allison? Hey, I just wanted to circle back onto the triclip here conversation because it looked like a bunch of chats were coming in for that. Um, I agree actually with Dave's answer fully on that question though. It's really dependent on uh, what the scenario is, but some folks are saying here, I just want to bring these up so I can cancel them out so we can get to the other questions, is um, basil bark garlon four with oil looks like um, what they're using on some stumps. And then it looks like we had some rate questions around triclopyr. And then someone else had an interesting comment, which said um, they've been recommending triclopyr herbicides be applied to Tree of Heaven before removal, then waiting 30 days um before the removal to help reduce the root sucking and then going in and treating the stump i would guess which i would think that that's maybe not a terrible idea the question was has anyone here attempted such methods no we're getting head nods no but in theory that doesn't sound terrible to me okay <laughs> sorry to derail no thanks for that allison uh pete uh do you want to answer some of that? Uh, sure. I actually was going to comment on something that Matt said earlier. But um, so in Pennsylvania, what we were doing before we started treating all of the trees as traps, um, we would basically put, um, why am I having a brain fart right now? You would chop um, sections of the bark out and then leave a little bit of live tissue in between and work your way around the tree. So you don't wanna completely girdle it because if you do that, then the product won't flow up and down. So you wanna leave some live tissue while they were calling it the hack and squirt method. So you hack into the bark, leave some live tissue and squirt the triclopyr directly into those hacks. So you're, it'll flow throughout the tree and it will kill both the canopy and the root zone. So if it's a tree that's not in um, a detrimental area and it can just fall in the woods, then you can go about the hack and squirting without actually having to physically remove the tree. Um, and if it is a tree that you then later need to take down, then obviously you can treat the stump at that point as well. Um, but earlier Matt spoke about access on properties. And I just wanted to comment that it may be a good idea to get out and look at these properties before you're going to treat them because these trees will grow in the absolute worst environment possible. So you may want to get out there with some shears and cut your way in so you do have access to get to the tree so you can do the basal bark spraying without having to fight all of the other flora in the area. Perfect. Thanks for that, Pete. Um... Greg, we'll go to you. Yeah, we, we'd actually brought somebody in that had done a lot of work on Tree of Heaven Control um, in Maryland primarily, but they, uh, you know, it was like what Peter was saying, they were, you know, really emphasized you're gonna do the hack and squirt, not to cut all the way around, because basically what happens, like you also initiate the defense response of Tree of Heaven, where all of a sudden it'll start throwing up a lot more root suckers, like if you girdle the thing completely. And something else I told is, you know, even if you go in and you're applying herbicides and treating the trees, like to really plan on monitoring those sites for at least two to three years afterwards, because you will get, you know, some, some sprouts popping up and so you'll need to go back and take care of those. But of course, that's a lot easier to, you know, to spray over the top and kill them than, uh, you know, taking the tree down. And that, um, you know, he really emphasized everybody that killing the top part is really easy. Like you could apply it, you go back like, in a couple of weeks and the whole tree will be, you know, top of the tree will be dead. He said, you know, the, the big challenge is getting everything that's down below that, uh, you know, with the root suckering or the grafting. Um, so yeah, you saying, you know, you, but you, if you plan on it and do it, you can definitely take care of it. You can get rid of it. 
Perfect. Thanks for that, Greg. And Allison. Nope, I just forgot to unraise my hand. No. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Well, the uh, the next question I'll ask um, is how would you prepare for an impending infestation or what do you wish you would have done before spotted lanternfly hit? This is, you know, I think a really good question for all of those individuals that are attending right now today that uh, don't have it right now. What should they do to be prepared that uh, you wish you would have done? Paul. So, like I mentioned earlier, is that one of our um, things is to have a, a, a reporting site because we went old school and you know, did the phone to realize what a nightmare that became. Absolute nightmare. And then thinking that email would be so much better and that was just as bad. So having a, a, a website that didn't require a ton of people, um, you know, it, you don't have to worry about it clogging up or, you know, access or any of that stuff, um, was probably one of the best things that we we did, as well as having a message that, what do you want the public to do? Do you want them to report it? Do you want them to stomp it? Do you want them to do both? I mean, we started out as reporting it because we wanted you know that, but now we don't want them to report it. We just want them to stomp it out. And so having that you know idea earlier it would just save us some work and and also you know a consistency and message for the public uh, and, and for the industries that we work with as well um that and to probably get industries that you know shipping especially shipping industries to take this more seriously and and you know be part of the permit system use the best management practices those are probably the things that I would focus on prior, just so when you do have it, and probably all of us expect that most people will eventually see this, that you know, you're ahead of the game. Great, thanks for that. Uh, Pete, we'll go to you. Uh, so again, rather than waiting until you see the lantern fly, one thing that you can do is try to familiarize business owners, uh, primarily in commercial settings, if they're doing a lot of shipping out of state. Um, you know, you can't expect everybody to be able to decipher the difference between a sumac and an Atlantis tree, but you can kind of get them familiar with what they're looking for. And then if they think that they have the potential right conditions for an infestation on their property, they can reach out and then have the correct personnel come out and determine whether or not they think it could be a problematic area for the future. So then you can get them on a list and you can uh, do an inventory of the trees prior to having the insects get there so that when they do come in, you already kind of have a leg up and you're ready to go rather than scrambling and saying, which properties do we think we need to treat first? If you already have an idea of which ones have a heavier Atlantis infestation, then you will also have a heavier lanternfly infestation there. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, we'll go over to Matt now. I, I can't say enough about planning. Um, first of all, you know, I think Paul hit a, a key point. Plan, have a communications plan. What is your message? Getting that word out to everybody. And, and, and to Peter's point, getting it out to industry, getting it out to the public, because they're going to be your eyes and ears on the ground. Uh, very few organizations have enough people or staff, never going to have enough to get out there and, and be everywhere at all times looking and knowing what they're looking for. So educating the public, educating industry, making sure that everybody knows not just what uh, the insect looks like, but also I think, you know, Peter hit on a key point, knowing what Atlantis looks like. Where is Atlantis? That's one of the big things that we saw very early is, you know, nobody really knows. They kind of have a feeling yeah, it's in disturbed areas. It's along the highway. It's along the rail. But when you really come down to it and ask where, where is 
Atlantis in your state or in your area, very few people know everything or know where that happens. And so that's where you really need engagement from both industry and the public to help you identify where are those places that it's going to show up or could show up that where there's some potential hosts. And then what's your action plan? What are you going to do operationally? What are you going to do as an action? Are you going to treat it? Are you going to remove the hosts? Knowing and establishing that very early on uh, is very key. Uh, we've had several states now without spotted land and fly who have begun like a very lengthy planning process and knowing and understanding at the, at the state government level and municipal state government level, who has what authorities, who has what staff, where do those staff, you know, where are they day to day? What is their job and responsibility? You know, and can they be eyes and ears on the ground? If they find a Lanthus, can they remove it? Do they have the authority to remove it? Do they need permissions to remove it? Getting those things established and out of the way. And then again, to the chemical piece, knowing what chemicals you can use um, can be used. What's registered in your state? What can the homeowner use versus what can a commercial applicator use? And do you have the right licenses, training, and registrations to be able to do that? Um, if that's the way you're going to go, being able to have the tools ready and available is key. But it all comes back to having some sort of a plan and knowing where you're going to go first. But it, 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 it requires a knowledgeable, educated industry, public, you know, general uh, public and, and perception so they understand what, what to look for knowing what Atlantis looks like and knowing where to look too is also in, important because I think Peter hit on a, a big piece too. You know, we see a lot of distribution with tractor trailer traffic as well as with rail um, distribution warehouses and centers, uh, you know, our, our courier services, you know, those areas are gonna move for us. They're, they're what we've seen time and time again, moving life stages of spotted lanternfly uh, from point A to point B. And that's key, knowing where those are, because we've we found ourselves in conversations with industries that we may not be familiar with, such as railroads. You know, I don't know, I can tell you, I didn't know as much about the railroad uh, a year or two ago that I do today. Um, discussing, discussing these issues with the railroad industry has really uh, educated me and, and how they operate and where they see priorities and how those priorities compete with the uh, Spotted Lanternfly program. Perfect, thanks for that, Matt. I'll move over to Katie now. Ed, um, the message that you first have, um, if you're expecting Spotted Lanternfly, if you have a little population, um, that message is gonna change and it will also determine how the public will react like going forward. Um, I know when Delaware, when we had our uh, one spotted lanternfly in Wilmington in the city, um, we, had, uh, we had automated message for email saying, you know, if you see spotted lanternfly, let us know. But if you also have tree of heaven, you're, you're, you qualify for a treatment program if you, you know, meet the, the, um, if you meet the criteria of, a, of Delaware's treatment plan, which is having spotted lanternfly and having tree of heaven. And that was for both private and business. And that was a, a huge mistake uh, because we kind of let the public dictate when when or if they're going to get a treatment instead of us taking more control over it. Um, so right now we have a, a particular homeowner who had who had a treatment treatment a um, couple years ago and now she expects one every year and she's already in, in an infested area. Like even if you treat these these two trees that she has, it's not going to make a huge difference. Um, it's more of a community effort than anything right now. And um, so with our new satellite populations in the South, in, in, in Southern Delaware, like at the beaches, um, you know, we tell people, if, if you have spot lanternfly, we'll come out. 
and that's it. Um, I don't mention anything about treatment. If, if you qualify for treatment, I'll let you know. If you have spotted lanternfly and you, do, and you don't qualify for treatment from the state, you know, here's some resources. Um, so we do have a automated email and an automated phone number, phone message that says if you're from Newcastle County, which is our, our infested county, um, we, you, do, you are not getting a call back. Uh, however, here's a phone number for our master gardeners, our volunteers to actually like, give you some answers if you have any questions. Um, another thing is, is that uh, getting your, represent your representatives, excuse me, on board um, in, in your infested or, or your, your counties, um, getting them ready because they're going to get a, a, a bunch of angry messages that are like, well, the Department of Agriculture isn't helping me, uh, so you have to help me. And uh, so I have to send a a concise message to our representatives in Newcastle County saying, you know, we're not treating private properties. We only treat railroads, distribution centers, blah, blah, blah. And that kind of helps um, any representatives or, or mayors or the, the governor be able to, you know, give them, give the public a precise answer. And, um, yeah, so far it has been working dealing with the public like that. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, managing expectations is a big thing. Uh, I, I could definitely see the, uh, the the hassles that you probably had to go through when you know the the homeowner expects something after getting it once, and it's hard to take that away sometimes unless that's kind of effectively communicated. So. No, I like that approach. Right. Yeah. And you once once you find that one spotted lanternfly, you want to treat every single tree of heaven in in the area. And sometimes that's not the best route to go on. Sure. Well, thanks for that. Uh, Greg, we'll go on to you. Yeah, I'll probably echo some of what uh, has been said before. But yeah, definitely like uh, uh, thinking ahead as to like you know, all the different groups you might have to interact with because that was something that uh, Pennsylvania learned right from the start because there's lots of groups that don't get any news or any bulletins or any alerts from, you know, Department of Agriculture or anybody in the green industry because they're, that doesn't apply to them, but they have products that sit outside in a yard that can sit out in the weather that have the possibility of moving spotted landfly egg masses because they're in close proximity to tree of heaven or they're, you know, against a fence where there's you know, tree of heaven all along that, that outside fence. So trying to get that message out and get them engaged, like all these groups that are moving product that sit outside, they have a possibility of moving an egg mass. And, and then, you know, like uh, Matt had said before too, like making sure your state, if they're really concerned about it, have like labels and products set up ready to go for spotted land fly that they don't have that hold up. And then if at all possible, and this again, it's just my, I always have to caveat this my own personal opinion not official usda but if you have the ability to have something where you could get slf when you're out at the site like there's a lot of times people find it and they'll collect a specimen and they'll they'll you know smash a couple that they can get to but it's sitting there right in front of them uh and then they leave and then you know it's set up for treatment and they come back and they'll do some treatment like katie said maybe they'll just do tree of heaven but they don't uh, apply to the area or they don't see spotted lantern fly uh, but maybe you you could have treated them or even hit them with something like a, even something as simple as a fly swatter. You could have hit them <laughs> at the time you're there to kill as many as you can find at that moment when you're on the site and you see them. I'd say, you know, maybe it would make a difference. Maybe it wouldn't. But and then there, I felt like there was a heavy overemphasis on the adult phase early on where people were waiting to do survey, waiting to do a lot of things till the adults are out. And the adult is a long life stage. And they, they, aren't ability, they don't have the ability to lay eggs when they first emerge. It usually takes like a month or two of heavy feeding before they get to, they're developed and they reach, you know, they get to mating and laying eggs. But um, yeah, that's also the scary stage because it's moving and flying. So if you do anything ahead of that time to either get people on board with what the nymphs look like, uh, you know, treatment scheduled for the nymphs, which we have now, you know, with the contacts, you know, I think that will go, and then also hitting the egg masses, that would go a long way to really trying to reduce those populations before you get to the adult phase, whether they can move and shift and go 
you know, different places where you're not doing a treatment. Uh, so yeah, I think it's more challenging. It's easier for the public to identify. And then like as Paul had said, I think people, there was lots of confusion. People thought it was a moth or a butterfly or because that fly incident was a fly and the way they would mount it with the wings out, people just kept thinking butterfly or moth where seeing it as it actually looks naturally occurring, I think helps out a lot and getting people to understand it doesn't chew up stuff. It doesn't bore into things. It's a phloem feeder. Uh, you know, and if you see signs like all this honeydew or things on your plants, that those are all other things to look out for also. But that's all I was going to say. Yeah, I think that's a, a right there. Um, when spotted lanternfly is depicted a lot uh, through illustrations, it's typically where you see it where its wings are kind of spread out. Um, but as we know, it's not a very strong flyer. And additionally with it, most of the time when you see it like that, it's after it's been killed. Um, but typically when you're seeing it, you have kind of the, the closed wings in and it looks a little bit different. Um, so I think maybe showing that picture a little bit more often, I think would be, be beneficial for people. But uh, yeah. yeah, and I think it's harder for people when they don't see like, like uh, totally stripped plants like you do with spongy moth or something else where, where they're seeing that damage they're seeing that physical damage like having a phloem feeder that's shooting honeydew everywhere like it just doesn't have the same impact like as far as seeing a tree totally stripped or a plant totally stripped or something yeah and that um uh there's a question in the q a um are spotted lantern fly killed when trees are chipped and that's one of those things where it's not boring underneath the the bark of these trees it's the phloem feeder so it's you know on, on top of that and it's putting its stylet in it's taking in some of those sugary tissues and so when you chip a tree if you maybe have some kind of like egg masses on there or if there's one that just doesn't fly off before you put it in the chip for sure, yeah, it'll be killed. But it's one of those things that it's not, when you when you kill the tree, it's not exactly killing them. It's uh, it's just different feeding behaviors with that. Okay, and then um, go to Pete. Yeah, uh, I'm backtracking here a little bit to what we were speaking about earlier with the trap trees, but if you can, uh, one good preparation is to determine male trees that you will keep as traps so you don't get the seed drop coming off of the females. Um, and also leave more trees than you think you may need because once the lantern fly come in and they're attacking the trees, the trees are now vulnerable. You have the honeydew there. They attract the ambrosia beetle. So you will lose some of your trap trees to the ambrosia beetle. And then they're not going to be there the following year as a host to kill lanternfly. No, that's good insight there. Thank you for that. Okay, so I'll move on to a, another question. Um, let me see here. Are there resources available for cities and municipal entities for managing spotted lanternfly? Do you have any suggestions? I can say one that um, I put in the chat. You'll have to scroll up a little bit for that. But uh, here at Rainbow Ecoscience, and I'll um, I'll post it again. We create a spotted lanternfly management guide. It's a good, just kind of like introductory resource to learn a little bit more about the pests, some of the management options, uh, when you'd be doing some of those treatments, as well as looking at the different levels of control that you're looking to do or whatnot, um, and. Uh, just put it in again. That's kind of a good resource to maybe just kind of start to get some introductory ways with it. But uh, I'll let the the panelists chime in. Um, do you have kind of any specific suggestions for more of the the government entities associated with it? Pete. Um, yeah, so the government entities, maybe they might not have as much experience dealing in plant health. Uh, and they may want to reach out to some local contractors such as myself. You know, we, this is what we specialize in. So if you're looking for um, just tips and tricks on what the best way is to go about this, reach out to the people who have been treating, even if it's not specifically lanternfly, you may not have them in your area yet, but someone who is familiar with um, you know, the Dynatephyr on the basal bark spraying or the hack and squirt method, just anything like that, reach out to some people who do have experience in the field. 
Perfect. Thanks for that. Uh, Matt. Yeah, so uh, I, I would say that uh, additionally, and you mentioned Eric, what Pete mentioned, I would also say, of course, the university system has uh, land grant universities have been very instrumental. Of course, Pennsylvania and Penn State has been a, a big presence uh, with the beginning of Spotted Lantern Fly and has really provided a lot of great information to a lot of states. Um, but then there are other, uh, you know, universities that have also started their own uh, through extension and through outreach, uh, have done a lot of great work uh, with education and, and understanding. So there are a lot of resources uh, available. And then I would say your state departments of ag uh, have also been, you know, really great at taking a lot of information, um, both from their land grant universities and from others, uh, and presenting and providing that, providing talks and, and educational resources uh, to help people, uh, you know, and industries become educated and understand exactly uh, what the what this insect is, and and again identifying it, uh, looking at that. In terms of, you know, I know a lot of people a lot of times look at well monetarily and funding um, for state agencies, for state government and state agencies. Um, a lot of state agencies will apply for federal funding. Um, that's how a lot of spotted lanternfly funding uh, is through cooperative agreements with our state partners. Um, so a lot of whether it's outreach or it's survey or it's uh, mitigation, a lot of that funding is is through uh, the Plant Protection Act 7721. Um, a lot of people know it as the Farm Bill. Um, a lot of that money comes to state entities. They apply for it um, and put in suggestions as well as researchers. They do the same thing and they gain uh, with their suggestions, go through a review process and then they're able to hopefully procure uh, funding for their work, whether it's again, survey, outreach, uh, mitigation, um, and, uh, and, and so various aspects of the Spotted Lanternfly program through federal federal funding and through federal grants. I know that the US Forest Service has also uh, offered up some grant money uh, to some of the, the departments of natural resources through different states and di different entities and have worked that way. And a lot of times states will turn around and employ or go to non-government organizations like uh, industry, like uh, uh, contractors, whether it's uh, contractors for rail or contractors, landscape contractors, they will use uh, their authority to use those contracts uh, and get some of that work done as well. Perfect, thanks for that, Matt. Uh, Paul. I think for uh, the general public, having, whether it's the university, the state, having a website that is updated fairly regularly, but has the current information, you know, whether it's pesticide recommendations. I know way back, and I remember Dana saying, you know, also kind of giving them enough information so they don't feel like the sky is falling down and they have the resources and enough information about the insect to feel comfortable. And, um, you know, it, it gives them, like for us, we have it for, you know, industry, for businesses, then we have one for homeowners. And so just, providing that resource and, and having that out there, because I know in the past, we all like the pest alerts, but this insect changes so quickly that sometimes it's not, you know, it, it, by the time we have something, we think it, that's what it is, it's changed its mind and done something different. So pest alerts, but being able to do that digitally, that, you know, keeps everybody somewhat up to date on all the new, you know, research and, you know, and use other sources. I mean, Penn State, I, we go to New York, you know, we kind of cannibalize from everybody to make, you know, what we think and, and digestible for the public as well. You know, sometimes it might be a little too much. So you take the best out of all those. Perfect. Thanks for that. Um, I think uh, next, uh, I'll go through some of the Q&A questions that are in the chat right now. Uh, so first we have Charles is asking, you know, being that spotted lanternfly is found in Vietnam, a tropical country, 
Why is it not expected to invade South and Central Florida? I can tell you because I've been all over and through Vietnam, you watch too much Tropic Thunder. Um, so the whole idea is that everybody expects it to be very, um, you know, hot, steamy jungles, but the mountains are, are humongous. And, you know, like where you're, you know, it's summertime there and it, you know, when we're trekking, you know, it was 30 degrees at night. So it's our, our perception of what these countries look like, um, it, it, mostly from film, but, you know, it, they do have this, a lot of the same types of climates. Sure. Uh, Greg? Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, you know, what we know about it in Vietnam, it's not, you know, widespread and high populations all over the place. We're trying to find out more and understand, um, you know, how spotted lanterfly is present in South Vietnam, like where is it at and, right, why the populations aren't as high. And it could be because, yeah, it's not as, there's some areas might just not be as conducive for it as, as other areas, but there could be other factors. Uh, and for Florida, like if you're referring to the map that was put up there, uh, just bear in mind that those maps are just, they're predictive maps and they only put in certain elements in those maps when they're uh, making that prediction. So there are other maps that don't agree with that map. Uh, there's some variation across the maps depending on what uh, data set people are using uh, you know, to do their analysis and the information they have in there. Because uh, other areas have, they have parts of Florida that um, are uh, designated as potential for uh, SLF to be present there. Now, the question is whether it would be right at the level that it is now where it's really nice and happy where it's located now, <laughs> where you'd reach these huge levels. But then Florida has also said they just don't have that much tree of heaven like throughout the state. So, I mean, that could be, because I know that was one factor that was used in that map was um, tree of heaven presence. But yeah, but there's a lot of unanswered questions, of course, until it moves into those areas. Because like any invasive insect, it could be encountering hosts that, you know, it has not encountered yet that it might really like that you know it's not on our radar at this time yeah. uh allison yeah i just wanted to jump on really quick and say kind of the same thing but part of it is because of the ilanthus range not being a heavily present in florida in my opinion but then yeah i spent sub sub substantial amount of time in vietnam and the weather there is not, I mean, it's it's on the tropical edge, but it's super variable. The microclimates up in Hanoi versus down on the Southern Peninsula are completely different. So a lot of that has to do with the perception of the weather. Um, and it actually is not that dissimilar to a lot of the rest of our sort of Midwestern Northeast range uh, temperatures, which is where we're seeing it right now. Perfect. Yeah, because I, I will say even in uh, South Korea, from working with the researchers there, uh, you know, because we have groups that go over there because, of course, uh, spotted lanterfly. It was an invasive in South Korea, but what they describe as high populations and low and medium is very different from ours. Like our hot high population is nowhere near. Like what they consider a high population is probably what we would consider medium here. So they're they're not having the like it really liked it here, unfortunately. Or that. Yeah. All right. So next question um, is from Brick. So spotted lanternfly has a doomsday feel to it and many are running around to try to mitigate the damage. What has happened in the areas that hasn't been able to stay ahead of it? And also with it, um, talking about the honeydew uh, has created kind of that sooty mold situation. Um, does anyone have any solutions on how to solve that, that sooty mold issue? So Paul, I, I, I think your hand's still up from last time, but uh, oh, do you have uh, any insight? My, my, my only thing, and, it, and it's more tongue in cheek, is what I, you know, to buy a power washer. Um, but that's, that was a, my tongue in cheek. <laughs> I mean, I, I, th I think there's some validity to that uh, regards to the power washer. 
Um, uh, Pete. Uh, the other thing you can do proactively, take a look at your property and try not to park under any trees where you're seeing the lantern fly, maybe move your patio furniture. But unfortunately, I've had this conversation with a lot of people who told me, oh, we haven't used our deck this year. We don't sit outside. Like there, there are times where the infestation gets very high. And unless you start getting rid of the insects, you're going to be dealing with the sooty mold. So yeah, I would second that the, uh, the pressure washer would be a good thing to have around. Perfect. Uh, Matt. And in terms of the first part of the question, I, I think it's an interesting question because, I mean, what we've seen in PA and even this year, last well, last year and this year, you know, we've heard several reports, multiple reports from both the public and from researchers that they're not seeing the same level of infestation. You know, they're seeing a reduced number of spotted lanternfly. Meantime, you know, we're seeing higher numbers in areas that we hadn't previously. Um, you know, so I think it's still, we're still in that point where we're trying to understand, you know, is there a potential population threshold? Does the environment only support a, a certain number or level? Does the host only, the hosts only support a certain level of spotted lanternfly before there's a reduction? Or is there something else going on that we're not seeing or understanding? Uh, certainly in Pennsylvania, uh, and, and in other areas, New Jersey and Delaware, we've heard, you know, hey, I, I, you know, and this is from homeowners, hey, you know, I, last year I had thousands or hundreds of them. This year I don't, I can barely count, you know, four or five. Um, so it's kind of difficult. It's been challenging for us to try and understand what's happening because, again, in some areas we've seen a reduction or a, at least a, a, an anecdotal reduction observed reduction of the spotted lanternfly populations, but yet in other areas we've seen, you know, explosion in numbers higher than they had seen previous in previous years. So it's, it's hard to determine is this a, a distribution, a natural distribution where they gain a certain size, the population gets to a certain size and they start to move or they're, they're moving out. Again, is it related to the amount of hosts available? We're not sure. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of control, uh, focused control measures being taken uh, at, at many states and, and a lot of work being done to reduce them. It, you know, what's that impact? Because we're working on trying to measure that impact. Uh, even as we speak, you know, we've been developing and trying to develop evaluation tools to try and evaluate the overall treatment and the impact to the overall population. Because you know, obviously people want to know, is it having an impact? If I treat my yard or if I treat these areas year after year after year, I go after multiple life stages, is it really having an impact? Or am I just, you know, um, emptying the canoe one Dixie cup at a time? Uh, it's hard to say. Sure. Greg. Yeah, I was just going to address the honeydew question, because uh, if you but out there where it's at where it seems like most of the people on here have been on here, have been under trees or under uh, other foliage that uh, they're feeding on that, um, yeah, when you get to a certain level, certain population levels, it is just, it's raining down. Like if you've been in an area with spongy moths and hear the frass raining down when they're feeding, the caterpillars are feeding heavily, that's what the honeybees, like you just hear it coming down. And uh, since they are, you know, bloom feeders and they like those high turgor pressure hosts and they're super heavy feeders it is just like in some cases it's just coming out of them like a little jet so you can't really do anything <laughs> it's just yeah it's just coming down like crazy i don't know anybody's come up with a good solution other than what other people suggested is tr try and clean stuff off power wash stuff but i guess if you had maybe a tree of heaven that was overhanging something and that's where they're mostly on probably they got rid of that tree of heaven they might yeah not have as much of an issue for whatever was underneath it. Yeah, yeah. For for those of you who have not seen this pest in uh, in the field or kind of in person, um, it really is a really strong phloem feeder. It's pretty incredible, kind of how much uh, you know honeydew it produces. 
you know, one of the things that's you know, fairly common around the United States are aphids and aphids will, you know, produce honeydew and some city mold, but um, at a significantly less rate. Uh, the, the production of spotted lanternfly is pretty incredible. Um, so one of those things that uh, you have to see to believe sometimes. Okay. Uh, next question is, uh, someone is asking about uh, xylem and pentapark for spotted lanternfly. If yes, so uh, what mix rate was used and what timing was used specifically in New Jersey? And so, uh, you know, for this, uh, Dave, I actually would be great if uh, you could kind of chime in on this. Um, I don't know specifically with xylem, but uh, for us, we do have a Dynatefron product called Transtect. It uh, comes in water soluble packets. And we have done you know, research with it. We've used a lot of kind of different rates. Um, but Dave, do you have uh, uh, any kind of insight with that uh, for using Transtect or um, the implementation of an organosilicone uh, bark penetrant? Yeah, um, for yeah for Transtect, it's you know it's the you know twelve packets per gallon, um, and then adding in the. We use scrimmage or that's uh, organosilicone surfactant. We found that these the surfactant actually um, speeds up the active activity of the um, product, it gets in the tree faster. So I think we saw a weak difference in the performance. You know, we saw can we saw a kill either way with Transtect as a bark spray. It just worked faster with the organosilicone surfactant. You know, and, and xylem is a liquid formulation. It's from PBI. Uh, I believe the rate is like one quart per gallon or something like that. I, I don't know exactly the rates per se, but it's uh, it's a liquid formulation. I think it's a 10% versus our 70% material. Okay. Uh, Pete. Yeah, um, we do use the Pentra board, just kind of as an added punch to help out um, more so if you're going to be treating uh, late season when they tend to jump hosts you know you're going to be treating um, the maples willows birch things like that then i would definitely use it um, but again like we we will use it on the atlantis trees but they're a thinner bark tree so you don't necessarily need quite as much of the pentra bark in there uh, as far as timing goes um, i've seen the trans tech start working within an hour. Um, it's pretty incredible how fast you'll start getting a kill on that. And the timing of the treatment, um, you don't want to do it too late in the day. You want to make sure that the tree is pulling so it doesn't just run off the bark or dry on the bark and not actually get into the tree. Um, if you're treating first thing in the morning, make sure that the, the bark is dry that it didn't rain the night before. Cause again, if the bark is already wet, you don't want it just running off the tree without actually fully penetrating and getting inside. Great. Um, uh, another question here, this is from Dale. Have you worked with a forced assessment strike team, uh, acronym is FAST, and if so, how effective was the mapping for uh, spotted lanternfly? I'll say personally right now, this is actually the first time I've heard of a forest assessment strike team. So um, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm seeing a kind of couple head nods here. It looks like, uh, does anyone else have experience with them? Yeah, um, an interesting thing. And unfortunately, I don't really have a great answer to that, but uh, I'll, I'll be looking into that a little bit more after this. Um, another question. This is from Zachary. Uh, my dog likes to eat cicadas. Are spotted lanternfly toxic to animals or humans? Which also ties into the other question, which is, is SLF edible? Could a potential strategy be to harvest them for animal feed? Greg. Yeah, we, we had to do some work on that because there was that thought was put out there about SLF being toxic and animals eating them. And so you know, uh, Pennsylvania and Penn State like sent off some nymphs and adults to get uh, analyzed at um, 
remember the name of the lab in Pennsylvania that does a lot of toxicology work for them. But there was that concern too because they were it was uh, adults were being found harvested in um, in alfalfa hay, and so there was you know same thought like blister beetles because there's that they contain cantharidin like blister beetles, but they don't produce it or secrete like blister beetles. It's just kind of there, but the amount that was in them was so small, it was like insignificant. It wouldn't be enough to do anything or cause a problem. And, and then, you know, it's used for medicinal purposes in China. And we reached out to South Korea to see like, did you ever have any incidents of either children or animals or anybody, anything having to do with spotted lanternfly ingestion? And they, they had no reports, no information on that. And we couldn't find anything out of China either. So we just concluded that, yeah, they do contain cantharidin, but yeah, there's not enough for it to be, uh, you know, toxic. Because there were some reports of people's dogs eating them and then throwing up. But again, I don't, I don't know, because dogs will eat lots of other things and throw up. So I, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard. But yeah, and then there was a, an issue with like kids grabbing them and eating them too. But we felt like they probably don't taste that great. So we don't think they'd probably be eating, eating a lot of them. But yeah, I've heard like chickens have gotten used and some bird species too. It seems like they've adapted to the taste and like that. I mean, not enough to impact the populations, but over time, that seems like that's occurring. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, one of those things that it, that that question made me think of uh, one of our one of our colleagues that lives here in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Uh, he has ducks, and his ducks really enjoy eating Japanese beetles um, that uh, that die. So. Uh, I mean, I, I think with ducks, ducks kind of eat anything for the most part, but uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. All right, uh, Benjamin. And, oh. and yeah, I just want to say, I'm not sure if the wings contain some of the material like what Paul was talking about sequestering going on, but uh, even with some of the bird observations, they've noticed that uh, the birds have gotten really good at like snipping the wings off and eat them like as if they've over time learned like what part to eat and what part not to eat. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Cool. Uh, the uh, researcher at Penn State said that the the uh, the corvids, which you know again blue jays, crows, and all that, were pulling off the hind wings and eating them, but that's all that I'm aware of. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. All right. So next question from Benjamin. Uh, we have had good luck with word of mouth to get new customers for spotted lantern fly treatment. Can you recommend any other way to spread the word professionally? Katie. So on our website where we have um, uh, resources for homeowners to go and if they want to self-treat, um, or if they want to hire a professional, uh, we do have a database of people uh, or of companies who are um, our pesticide applicators and uh, who are who own a landscape company. So I'd probably reach out to your state cooperators and see, like, just say, you know, um, we're a resource. Um, you could put us on our on your website. I know we, you have to be, you can't be, um, you can't single out a single company, but that'll probably get the ball rolling with, with hey, maybe we should put a whole list together for uh, the public to go to, to hire a professional to do Spotted Lantern Fly. Yeah, that's a that's a great thing. I know for uh, Emerald Ash Board, there's been a couple different uh, states and municipalities that uh, will post a list of uh, approved contractors to do treatments in their kind of specific area. And it's a good way to to get some of that information out to homeowners as a as a resource there. Okay. Um. Dan is asking, in an area that does not have infestations yet, is there a suggested corridor with to inspect? Example, kind of how close to transportation corridors is it important to inspect? Matt. 
so I mean, so if you have a distribution standpoint, I mean, if you go to a site and and you are at a distribution warehouse, you know, obviously look for host material along the outside. Um, there's not a specified distance necessarily that I would say, you know, that you're gonna you're gonna necessarily be looking at, but especially if you're in, you know, if you if you're in a, a an area and you're surveying, I mean that's the big thing is a lot of states will go out and survey, and they may or may not find it, uh, and it may not be something that they detect until later stages. Till you have life stages that you can identify, like fourth instar in my background or the adults usually is what people catch. They may catch other nymphal stages, the first or third instar nymphs. Um, they may pop up and people may see them, but um, you know, I, I don't know that there's a specific corridor. We are focusing on distribution sites. Um, so obviously areas that bring in products or things that are brought in from areas known to have spotted lanternfly are gonna be where you wanna start looking. Um, and again, I, I think you heard from Eric, I know you heard from Paul, and others, I mean, that, that could be a lot of places. Um, where are you getting tourists? Where are you getting out of state folks visiting your state? What's coming in from the local warehouse, from warehouses to your local warehouses? Where do you have rail? Truck stops obviously was mentioned several times. Highways, interstate, roadside rests, those kind of places have all been areas that we found spotted lanternfly. So, I don't know that you can prescribe a distance or, or specific distance um, in that way, but that is something that, you know, when we start to survey, we use visual first. Uh, some of the traps that have been mentioned, whether it's a sticky band trap, a bug barrier, or circle trap, you know, we're placing those primarily on Tree of Heaven. Uh, if we don't have Tree of Heaven in the site, then we're looking at other hosts like maple, which has been mentioned, or black walnut, that the or anything near wild grape. Those are areas that those are things that we're also capitalizing on. But you can start start setting that up again, understanding that there is no lore currently, there is no pheromonal lore uh, for this insect. So um, putting up a trap, you know, is is something that you can do. It's just gonna, you know, cut down on visual. You're gonna have to still go back and, and go back and check that trap, but you don't really have anything attracting the insect necessarily to that particular trap other than other than the tree itself. Perfect. Uh, Paul. I would also add, um, and it's kind of, we call them uh, international economic free trade zones here in New Jersey. And they're basically the, what Matt was saying or like the warehouses, but they have some kind of, you know, thing where like everything that comes right from the port goes there. And I know that, you know, that's the same in other states as well. So it's also a good place to look for other pests. You know, it doesn't have to be lanternfly too. Yeah. Um, Greg. Yeah, and from what Matt was saying too, you know, just focusing on uh, some of those uh, different, there's so many different things that could potentially move an egg mass is what some of the, the challenges there. You know, if it's an adult, then usually it'd probably be like something that could survive. It wouldn't be a, like long distance, uh, you know, just from what we know now, it'd probably be something that like a shorter distance movement, but I do know that you know what some groups have done as soon as they find SLF is they immediately go on to like the neighboring um, rail lines and start and they put in a lot of effort and do a lot of searches along the rail line. But that's you know I, I wouldn't necessarily do that or expend that that much resources that way. Uh, it does you know in the areas where we have uh, heavy infestations or what we consider like the right the generally infested area. There is like a strong association with rail and spotted lanternfly, but there's also that strong association with the tree of heaven and rail. So they kind of end up there and then they get moved, you know, by a uh, train. But in other areas, um, yeah, I would kind of search around the area where you find it because they do tend to stay initially when their initial population kind of tend to stay where they're at um, and kind of tend to stay uh, 
predominantly, at least that's what our experience has been on Tree of Heaven and in those areas. And then it's as they build and the numbers grow, then that's when they start distributing out. And then you will start to see some of those flight activities that um, people have seen a lot of videos on. So it really depends on on what you find at the site when you go there, you know, as far as where you want to search and survey and um, try and address, is I guess the best way I can put it. And then Matt Helmuth, I know people put out that iEco lab, but he's done that for some of the other areas where he's just identified different potential groups that could move spot of landfly or industries. And then, you know, you can zoom in and keep zooming in and he actually has like some addresses from the databases. Um, and then also the permitting systems that the states have set up for groups that come in and move material in and out, or they're you know spending some time in the infested areas. Those are meant to be uh, open so that other states can check and say like, well, what what groups are coming in and out of my state that are also going to SLF land? And so they, it's a way for them to check too to see if like those those areas or those groups might have uh, incidentally moved it or if they're keeping up with their permit. But um, there there are some good starting points. Perfect. Um, and do one last question, uh, kind of along those same lines. Uh, what monitoring systems do you recommend um, for this? So, and for those who are in areas that it's not currently in yet. Matt. I mean, I think, and I think, you know, again, I, Paul and Katie, you know, have said this multiple times. I mean, rely on your public, rely on the public, the industry, your tree care industry, your arbor, you know, your arbor care industry, your landscapers, and educating them um, because they're going to be out there every day uh, conducting their business, doing what they do every day. And if they know what to look for, they're familiar you know, they're going to be a great resource. Um, I don't know, you know, again, visual survey, visually looking for these things has been just as effective. And in many cases, we have become aware of populations. States have, have found out about populations that they were not aware of previously because somebody, you know, sent a picture, somebody reported something, uh, somebody mentioned something to an extension specialist, or somebody in the industry, you know, called or talked to um, somebody from the industry or from the university system. That's that's the best way. I mean, there's not a, you know, a system. We have it again. We have a trapping system for monitoring, but it's it's just as effective. Uh, visual is just as effective. We don't have a lure that attracts these uh, insects. So we have found that again, if you have an engaged public, if you have people who kind of familiar with what to look for, they're gonna be the ones to alert you to, hey, you know, this is coming in. And, and, and again, getting pictures, the ways of screening those in, that information is important. Paul capitalized on that several times. You, know, you, you need to have a method to screen those calls, screen those reports so that you're not out, you know, kind of on a wild chase looking for that elusive spotted lanternfly that may or may not be there. Sure. <clears throat> Pete. Uh, so in Pennsylvania, we have programs in place to educate. Uh, again, a lot of it is shipping departments that will be going out of state um, to check their cargo, check their trucks. So again, in other states where they may be getting things from an infested area, Again, you don't want to just look for the insect. You want to educate people on what the egg masses look like so that they can inspect anything coming in. If you can get to the egg masses before they hatch, then that's a good way to stop the spread right there. Perfect. All right. Well, um, looks like we're right at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and so just have a couple more slides that I'll go through. Um, uh, well, actually, Greg, you have your hand up. I'll, I'll let you have maybe the last word. Hey, I was just, uh, I thought, you know, because I've used this before with other groups is um, with the bark spray treatment is that uh, 
Peter and his company, you know, they had provided like some really, I thought really good recommendations to try and optimize that bark spray that uh, I think I'm guessing you're probably still using those, Peter, because you mentioned one about the bark being wet, not applying then, but I, you know, I've told other people if they have the ability to do these things that you'd passed on, like I, I definitely provided that information. So I don't know if you want to mention the other, the other things you go by for the bark spray to try and optimize it. I'm sorry, mentioning other what? You you had like a couple of different recommendations. I know early on when I, I've seen a presentation that you, uh, you and your uh, father had done about, the, you know, kind of several things that you follow uh, in order to optimize the bark sprays, uh, you know, in terms of like time of day and like time of year, like that kind right. of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, so again, it's not something because actually we have seen on some of the properties that have been treated, you know, within the state project, sometimes you end up on properties where there have been other contractors there and you can see that the trees have been treated with the Dinotefuron, but they're not killing the insects. And the, the best explanation that I can come up with for that is either A, they're not mixing the rate correctly, or B, they're not spraying at the right time. Uh, maybe they're doing other work throughout the day and they're swinging by late afternoon and hitting these trees. Well, if again, if you're spraying it late in the day and the tree's not pulling, well, then it's just gonna dry on the bark and you're not getting any efficacy there. So um, yeah. We like to do it typically between, depending again on the, the time of year and what the sun is doing, but like right now, uh, between like 7 a.m. and 2 p.m. seems to be a really optimal time. Um, you know, I, I really try hard to shut down the dino spraying after two o'clock, uh, use the, the bark penetrant. Um, and another thing that you can do, you know, I mentioned earlier, if maybe your employees aren't familiar with the plant health side of things is you can do some mock spraying, put some water in a sprayer and go out and just soak the base of the tree, just so you can get an idea of how much product you're going to use for a certain size tree or how many trees you're going to get out of one gallon. That right there, I think, is really a, a great training tip. Um, if you're going to be doing systemic bark sprays with Dinotefron, I think uh, before your uh, technicians go out there and do the work, uh, having them practice to kind of get down their application methods um, and making sure that they're putting down the right amount of product, that's a great way to uh, get people kind of familiarized with how to do those. And again, um, like I said, I've, I've seen the transects start working very fast. So maybe on the first couple of trees that you do, you come back in a few days just to make sure that it is working correctly and you're seeing those dead insects. Because when you can actually see them on the tree, when they pierce through the bark with their proboscis, you'll actually watch them. Um, they basically start seizing on the tree you can watch them die so you'll know whether or not it's working and do you still hold off to like late june early july before you start those uh for the lantern fly specifically yes um i can tell you that early on in the project we did do some um some transect spraying in june that was still effective in the adult phase um but at this point yeah, we know that they're not feeding on those Alanthus trees in the early life stages. So basically we're looking at um, mid to late July, early August. And that way when they do hit adulthood, you're at maximum efficacy and you're gonna see a really good kill. Yeah. Paul, did you have any insight there? Uh, I was just gonna ask Pete, are you using the regulator on, your, on the, the sprayers? So you're not, you're kind of spraying at, you know, the correct, uh, sorry, my dog, uh, PSI. Uh, so we actually, everything that we do in our business, we try not to use 
uh, the large commercial high pressure sprayers again, just because oh, we're using backpack. And yes, because we tend to again going off the earlier question that negative perception of the pesticide spraying when we tell people that everything that we do is a low pressure spray, they seem to really take to that very well. So even on the larger properties, we're using backpack sprayers and that seems to work very well for us. But are you using the regulator so you know that the pressure in the tank is, so you're getting a consistent, I guess, spray for the tree. You know, like, you know, it's, it's I don't know, I wanna say 40 PSI or whatever, that as you're spraying, the next tree is still getting 40. So, you know, it kind of limits that it, if it's above or below, it won't, you know, if it's too high above or below, it won't spray, keep it at that correct um, PSI. As of right now, no. Um, you know, we've just, I've been doing this for years and we just kind of go off of um, our knowledge of what it's supposed to look like on the tree you know you can see how wet the bark is getting and then as it starts to drip you know you can you can tell if it's spraying correctly or not okay yeah i i yeah that too it's just that i don't know if you're using that as the as a uh you know like a, to to teach so then you have that mind's eye you know view of what what the chem what it should look like Okay, now that's something I could look into for the future, but as of now, no, we are not using any of the uh, regulators. Dave. Yeah, there's a constant flow valve that you can use on your sprayer that can you know limit the pressure that's put out by just like 15 PSI. So if your tank's higher than that, you're still only putting out 15 PSI. If it's below that, you're not, it's not spraying at all. So it gives you a consistent amount of product that's being done so you tie that in with like a metronome or you know you're counting to say okay i can spray this much amount in this much time you can dose the tree accurately every time yeah and additionally with that i was just gonna um gonna conclude that uh another alternative option um is to do trunk injections directly into the tree with dinotepron as well you get kind of an immediate kill there um and there's it's not kind of it gets a defined rate that you'd be applying at that, but that's also an alternative option as well for treating some of these trees. That's a good option for uh, close to water because again, that's something that we've been, um, especially with the Department of Agriculture, they did a really good job of marking out wetlands and making sure that those trees weren't being treated with uh, with the spray. Yeah. Great. Well, um, with that, uh, I think we can go ahead and conclude the panel here. Um, thank you so much for um, your assistance in this, uh, Dave, Pete, Matt, Katie, Greg, as well as Paul. Um, really appreciate your insights here. So with that, I just have a, a couple slides. Um, again, thank you for attending the webinar today. Um, if you haven't already, well, you can sign up for some of our other upcoming events at rainbowecoscience.com. We have a couple other webinars that we'll have going on. Um, and at the conclusion of this, when you leave this, uh, there'll be a survey that follows this webinar. If you can take a few minutes to fill it out, uh, your feedback is really greatly appreciated. Um, and additionally, there's just a couple of things that I wanted to hit on in regards to our uh, co-sponsor, Society of Municipal Arborists. Um, one of the things that Society of Municipal Arborists does offer is the Municipal Forestry Institute. It's kind of a game-changing high-level training opportunity in the leadership and managerial aspects of urban forestry. It's a week-long intensive program. It delivers a one-of-a-kind opportunity to grow a more successful community tree program. It's a place to learn and master leadership and management skills, for program administration, coalition building, uh, strategic thinking, program planning, and uh, public relations. And so this year's MFI is going to be held in Bowling, Bowling Green, Ohio in the last week of September. And so if you are interested in more information on that, um, it can be, details can be found on the SMA website as listed on here. And the last thing in regards to Society of Municipal Arborists is uh, they've announced that they're 
Urban Forestry Conference and Trade Show will be held in Seattle, Washington this year, November 14th and 15th. And this is gonna be in conjunction with Partners in Community Forestry Conference. This is a really fantastic way to learn and network. And this year's focus will be on the successful melding of trees and infrastructure and on building partnerships between municipalities and nonprofits to further tree canopy goals and communities. And so more information can be found on their website as well with that. 